I'm offering this talk to the feet of my guru, Swami Muktananda, his guru, Bhagwan Nityananda, and my guru's successor, Gurmai Chitvalasananda. I first met Shiva during my freshman year at Harvard. That day I had been speaking to a friend who meditated, and so after hanging out, I decided I would try it. I was in my dorm room, I sat on my bed, I closed my eyes, waited, nothing happened. Three minutes later, I said, this is so ridiculous. What a bore, it's not useful. And I decided I was tired and I would take a nap. So I lay down on my bed and I was awakened by the sound of breathing and choking. And it was my own breathing. I could barely open my eyes and I saw that my body was as rigid as marble. And I was gasping for air and I started to try to move and I was struggling with it and going into a convulsion. Well, the next thing happened was that I left and I was going through a tunnel. I then became aware to the sound of wind chimes and I opened my eyes and I was sitting in a grass hut in a loincloth, bare chested, in a perfect lotus posture. And I was a man, so I didn't feel like myself at all and even had the thought, I am God. So into the hut came a young woman and she started crying and sobbing about her suffering and the suffering of the world. And I glanced at her out of the corner of my eye. And out of my eye came a stream of music. And the music was creating the whole story of mankind. And in that music, I saw human beings striving and trying and longing and wishing and all the intense and sincere effort of being a human being and the whole story of mankind was coming out of my eye as music and the music was singing it's hard to talk about what that was like that music but i think of beethoven's ode to joy is a one ray and this was 360 rays of that kind of choral bliss it was even difficult for my nervous system to handle the beauty of the music that was coming out of my eye and I started to weep and the tears hit the ground. And at that moment, I then woke up in my dorm room and I, for the next few months, I would think about what happened and just not be able to understand it or put it in any context and just wonder. Later on, when I met my guru, Muktananda, I heard about the myth of Shiva and how he creates the world through his glance, the Shiva Drishti. So the opening and closing of Shiva's eye is called Unmesha Nimesha. And the story goes that Shiva opens his eyes to create the universe and is so moved by the beauty of the creation that he sheds tears. And the tears hit the ground and become Rudraksha, which is the seeds that we wear, we yogis wear around our wrists and around our neck, Shiva yogis, the Rudraksha beads. Um, when I had thought that myths were these archaic, imaginary, crazy stories, I began to appreciate myths as containing very es true esoteric teachings in their structure. The, this is a poem from Hildegard von Bingen that I think is relevant to my experience. To the Trinity be praise. God is music. God is life that nurtures every creature in its kind. Our God is the song of the angel throng and the splendor of secret ways hid from all humankind. But God, our God, is the life of all. The Shaivite Tantric text, the Spandakarika, opens with these words. We laud that Shiva by whose mere opening and shutting of the eyes there is the appearance and dissolution of the world. To laud or venerate Shiva is in meditation is to venerate the formless reality principle itself, which takes the form of vibration of existence consciousness. In the Spanda school, Shiva's glance, or Shivadrishti in Sanskrit, is perceived as the dynamic throb, the vibration of existence consciousness. The first Shiva Sutra proclaims Chaitanyam Atma, God is consciousness. Awareness is the supremely gracious reifying principle, generously endowing the creation with the gift of being. 
In Muktananda's ashram, we sang a Shaivite text every day, the Guru Gita, which, like most tantric texts, takes place as a dialogue between Shiva and his consort Shakti. This text extols the Guru principle as the unfailing bridge that crosses the individual over to union with Shiva. Verse 59 goes like this. I will say it in Sanskrit so you can hear the word drishti, or glance, in it, and then I'll give you the translation. Sakala bhuvana srishti kalpita shesha pushtir, nikila nigama drishti, sampadam vyarta drishti, avaguna parimarshti sthatpadarte kadrishtir, bhavaguna paramishtir mokshamarge kadrishti. May the divine blessing of his glance always dwell upon us. His gaze creates all the worlds and makes everything to flourish. His perspective is from the sacred, seeing that wealth is of no use. His divine gaze removes all faults. It is focused solely on the highest truth. Like Vedic fire, his glance burns away illusions. His only goal, to lead others on the path, granting full freedom. His gaze is the central support of the theater of this world. It showers the nectar of compassion and contains all cosmic principles. His glance is Sachit Ananda, existence, consciousness, and bliss, the pure delight of self-knowingness. One of the foundational bedrocks of Shaivism is that the appropriate way to worship Shiva is to become Shiva, dispense with the worshiper-deity dichotomy, and become Shiva. That night in my dorm room, Shiva was true to one of his names, Hari, which means thief, and he hijacked me. But later I understood that whether I recognize it or not, I'm always participating in God's power of becoming by creating my world through my own glance. We are all personally endowed with, the Shiv with Shiva Drishti, the power of the look. <laughs> like the mantra says, Shivoham, I am Shiva. A 10th century text by Kshemaraj, the Pratyabhishna Hridayam, the doctrine of recognition, makes this point explicitly. I won't tell you the Sanskrit, but the English. Even in its limited condition, the individual soul performs the same five functions as does Shiva. The five functions are creation, dissolution, sustenance, redemption, and concealment. Redemption is grace. Um, so when you see Shiva do, in the Tandava, the Tandava, the dance of Shiva, you see the five functions, those five functions in his hand gestures, creation in the fl fire, uh, oh no, creation in the drum, the two-sided drum, uh, f dissolution in the fire, uh, sustenance in his fear not gesture, grace as he points to his foot, and uh, concealment or void, the nothingness and the, and the uh, absence of the appearance, which is not happening in any of the gestures. So um, it, thinking uh, when it is interesting to contemplate these five functions and to ask in what way are, am I capable of these five functions. Chemaraj is saying that we all have and use these powers in our lives. Thinking about how this is so is a nifty way to do the effort of identifying with the supreme principle. Actively contemplating one's identity with Shiva is the main sadhana of Shaivism. At the risk of annoying physicists, it is given even to non-science layperson to understand that, according to the findings of quantum physics, consciousness has a critical role in the manifestation of reality. The famous double slit experiment consistent, consistently demonstrates the part played by consciousness in molding the nature of physical reality. Quantum objects appear to behave differently when observed from when they are not observed. The act of observation would appear to compel an, elect an electron to assume a definite position, suggesting consciousness produces the results of the measurement. That reifying observer with which we are conducting our lives is the Shiva Drishti. We can explore this creative power of our observer, the Drishti, to understand in what ways we are shaping the reality in which we live, especially the social reality. Through what lens do we view the human beings around us? The gaze of my guru, Swami Muktananda, carried in it the unmistakable conviction of one's ultimate eternal nature, what Patanjali called Svarupa. The third aphorism in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, 
tada drashtu svarupe vasthanam. Drashtu is the drishti, the, the observer, and the first the aphorism before it, chittam vritti nirodha, stilling the mind, then tada drashtu svarupe vasthanam, the, the observer will know his own true nature, or we will, we will abide in the nature of the observer. So the gaze of my guru was, I was afraid to look at him because his earth-shaking gaze upheld the awareness of non-dual reality while simultaneously obliterating my egoic identification with the temporary. To look at him was to gaze into eternity and to lose one's boundaries, which was not always easy to bear sanely. Shiva's glance creates as well as destroys. In myth, Shiva dissolves the illusory de separation of created beings by a glance from his third eye. The glance from the third eye is the dissolution of dualistic perception and the obliteration of mental and emotional categories, and that is the act of Shiva's grace. With our glance, we create each other. If we choose the viewpoint of seeing the others around us as variations of the one seamless energy, as reflections of the self, we are aligning our glance with the power of the non-dual view of Shiva. This reverential, divinizing gaze that Martin Buber describes as I-Thou is the, an act of recognition. That recognition is the cognitive work of Kashmiri Shaivism. When people asked him to define himself, Baba used to say, often, I am as you see me. And you will see similar statements from realized sages and saints. Jesus asked a number of his disciples, who do people say that I am? And there were many answers forthcoming. Often through their viewpoint, people project onto the enlightened and indeed onto the unenlightened their own flaws and motivations so that the greedy think they are out for money, the power-driven accuse them of being ambitious, and those with unintegrated sexual drives are sure they are out for sexual conquest. The world is as you see it, is another saying my guru was fond of, in Sanskrit, the phrase is drishti srishti. It required a lot of strength to maintain oneself in Muktananda's presence. His unflinching conviction of the unitive nature radiated an en energy. His resolute extinction of the subject-object dichotomy changed the surrounding atmosphere into an enlightening crucible of obliterating spiritual fire. I had an unusually dramatic experience of this one night after the long evening chant that was held every night in our central courtyard. This chant was one of my favorites. At the end of the day, sitting in the moonlight on the cool marble floor of the courtyard in the in ashram in India, we sang a sweetly haunting text called the Shiva Mahim Nastotram. It contains descriptions and praises of the mythical activities and attributes of Shiva. That night, after the chant, I looked down and realized I was no longer wearing my Rudraksha Mala, my bracelet. It was nowhere to be found. I felt bad about this, as I had very few possessions, and this was one of them. However, as I passed by Muktananda's chair, I saw that the large lion statue on his side table had my Mala around the t crown of its head. I knew that it was mine because there was blue paint on the beads from a project I had been serving on that day, doing some painting. I was about to surreptitiously snatch the mala from the crown of the lion's head when the Swami nearby admonished me strongly that I'd had to ask Muktananda for it. By now I'd had so many non-ordinary experiences from contact with the guru that I was loath to initiate an encounter. But I knew if I wanted that mala back, I would have to do it. So I took a deep breath, stood before him, pointed to the bracelet on the lion's head and announced, that's my mala. <laughs> Years later, I would understand that the word mala is a homonym for the three types of impurities called the anava mala, the karma mala, and the maya mala that Kashmiri Shaivism says conceal our svarupa, our true nature, our Shiva nature. Instead of handing it to me, Baba took the bracelet in his hand, looked me in the eyes, and started spinning it around his index finger. As the mala spun, it glittered in the moonlight, reminding me momentarily of the Sudarshana chakra, the weapon, the sparkling circle that Vishnu has around his index finger. 
I think it's, it's meant to be a, a blade which will decapitate a person, the Sudarshana chakra. As the bracelet, bracelet whirled, Muktananda started speaking to me loudly. In fact, he was yelling, that's not your mala, that's not your mala, that's not your mala. It's not yours, but you can have it. And he flung it at me. When the mala came flying at me, it hit me in the chest, and upon contact, I began to ascend rapidly up into the air. I found myself miles above the courtyard, looking down, and I could see a white cord that was connecting me to the courtyard. I began to expand into the sky. I was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Later on, I would understand that the word tantra has the word is related to tan, which means extension. And tantra is about extending your sense of self. And my being was extending beyond. As I was extending into the sky, I could hear the sound. It's not yours, but you can have it. It's not yours, but you can have it. And hearing the laughter of my guru behind it. Soon I gradually contracted back to my usual size and shape, but of course I was struck dumb with ecstasy. Every cell in my body was peeling like bells and uh, ringing with light. Muktananda had used a sly pun on my Rudraksha bracelet to rid me momentarily of the three malas, the illusory impurities that keep the soul from experiencing itself as all-pervasive consciousness. I sat immovably in full lotus posture in the courtyard while the ashramites filed by, many looking at me with pity and disapproval as they had just seen me yelled at, hit with an object, and loudly reprimanded by the guru. One never knew from observing the exterior what was going on in Muktananda's interactions.